This is Space Time, Series 25, Episode 102. Coming up on Space Time, the James Webb Space Telescope develops a serious technical problem, but that hasn't stopped it from making some spectacular observations of Mars and Neptune. And it's now 200 years since the opening of Australia's first astronomical observatory. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's James Webb Space Telescope has developed the problem with a key part of its spectroscopic system used to analyse the chemical composition of objects. The issue centres on the mid-infrared instrument's grating wheel, used to allow scientists to choose the wavelength of light they want to focus on. The wheel is used in the medium-resolution spectroscopy mode, during which the camera gathers different wavelengths of light, called spectra, which act like chemical fingerprints to identify different elements and molecules. Launched in December and beginning scientific observations just a few months ago, James Webb is the largest and most powerful space telescope ever built. Mission managers first detected the problem back in August and have now decided to pause observations with the affected mode so they can come up with a workaround. NASA says the $10 billion Earth-orbiting observatory is otherwise in good health and the mid-infrared instrument's other three observing modes, imaging, low-resolution spectroscopy and coronography, are all operating nominally and remain available for scientific observations. The mid-infrared instrument is one of four primary science instruments aboard the telescope capable of taking both images and light spectra of distant objects across the universe. Unlike the Hubble Space Telescope, which is in low Earth orbit, just 520 kilometres above the ground, and which could be fixed during regular space shuttle service missions, the James Webb Space Telescope is orbiting some 1.6 million kilometres away from the Earth on the dark side of the planet, and well beyond the reach of existing manned spacecraft. This is Space Time. Still to come, James Webb may have a glitch, but that hasn't stopped it taking some spectacular observations of Mars and the planet Neptune. And this year marks 200 years since the construction of Australia's first astronomical observatory. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Well, NASA's James Webb Space Telescope may be suffering a bit of a glitch right now, but that hasn't stopped it capturing some spectacular images and spectra of the red planet Mars and the distant ice giant Neptune. The sensitivity of the giant infrared telescope has provided scientists with unique perspectives of the Martian surface, complementing data being collected by orbiters, rovers and other telescopes. As a result, James Webb can capture images and spectra with the spectral resolution needed to study short-term phenomena like dust storms, weather patterns, seasonal changes, and in a single observation, processes that occur at different times of the day. But there are issues. Because it's so close, Mars is actually one of the brightest objects in the night sky in terms of both visible light, which human eyes can see, and infrared light, which James Webb's designed to look at. This poses special challenges to the observatory, which was built to detect extremely faint light from the most distant galaxies in the universe. In fact, Webb's instruments are so sensitive that without special observing techniques, the bright infrared light from Mars is blinding, causing a phenomenon known as detector saturation. Astronomers adjusted for Mars's extreme brightness by using very short exposures, measuring only some of the light that hit the detectors, and then applying special data analysis techniques. Webb's first images of Mars, captured by the near-infrared camera, show a region of the planet's eastern hemisphere at different wavelengths or colours of infrared light. The brightness of the light is related to the temperature of the surface in the atmosphere. The brightest regions of the planet is the area where it's warmest. That's because that's where the sun is almost directly overhead. These brightest areas are dominated by reflected direct sunlight, and the revealing surface details similar to those apparent in visible light images. These include the rings of Huygens Crater, the dark volcanic rock in Certus Major, and the brightening in the Hellas Basin. 
In areas where the sun's light is more at an angle, James Webb sees thermal emission, light given off by the planet as it loses heat. And the brightness continues to decrease towards the polar regions, which obviously receive less sunlight, and even less light is emitted from the cooler northern hemisphere, which this time of year experiences its Martian winter. However, temperature isn't the only factor affecting the amount of light reaching James Webb. As light emitted by the planet passes through the Martian atmosphere, some of it gets absorbed by carbon dioxide molecules. Hellas Basin is the largest well-preserved impact structure on Mars, spanning more than 2,000 kilometres, and it appears darker than the surrounding area because of this effect. But the effect isn't thermal. See, the Hellas Basin is at a lower altitude and thus experiences slightly more air pressure. And that higher pressure leads to a suppression of the thermal emission at the telescope's specific wavelength range because of an effect called pressure broadening. Whereas the images of Mars are showing differences in brightness in greater over a large number of wavelengths from place to place across the planet at specific times of the day, the planet's spectrum is showing subtle variations in brightness between hundreds of different wavelengths which are representative of the planet as a whole. The infrared spectrum was obtained by combining measurements from all six of the high-resolution spectroscopy modes of James Webb's near-infrared spectrograph. Preliminary analysis of the spectra show a rich set of features that contain information about dust, icy clouds, what kinds of rocks are on the planet's surface, and even the composition of the atmosphere. The spectral signatures include deep valleys known as absorption features and highlight water, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. Meanwhile, spectacular new James Webb images of the solar system's most distant planet, Neptune, have also been captured for the first time. The new images, taken by observations using the near-infrared camera, are displaying the ice giant's rings in stunning, never-before-seen detail. Astronomers say they're the clearest look at Neptune's rings since NASA's Voyager 2 became the first spacecraft to visit Neptune during a flyby back in 1979. And it's the first time the rings have been seen in infrared light. As well as Neptune's ring system, its dust bands are also clearly visible in the new images. But one of the most striking features were seven of the planet's 14 known moons, including a spectacular Triton, which appears to far outshine Neptune itself. That's because instead of its usual royal blue colour, Neptune's methane gas atmosphere absorbs red and infrared light so strongly that it appears to be quite dark in near infrared wavelengths, except for the high altitude methane ice clouds, which appear as prominent bright streaks and spots reflecting the distant sunlight before it's absorbed by methane gas. Meanwhile, Triton seems to shine like a diamond because it reflects an average of 70% of the sunlight that hits it. The giant moon orbits Neptune in retrograde, that is backwards, and that's because it's suspected to have originally been a Kuiper Belt object like Pluto and Charon, but ventured too close and was gravitationally captured by Neptune. This is space time. Still to come, we celebrate 200 years since the opening of Australia's first major astronomical observatory, and later in the science report, a new study warns that TikTok is providing false and misleading information to users searching for news and factual information. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show for a word from our sponsor, NordVPN. You know, I don't have to tell you that when it comes to online security and privacy, NordVPN really is the best in the business. And at times like these, that's exactly what you need. They've got the fastest servers, they've got the best encryption, and they'll protect up to six of your devices at the same time. And that includes your smart TV, something a lot of people these days overlook when assessing their online security needs. And while we're talking about things overlooked, don't forget your router. NordVPN will protect that as well. So you get great security, great service, a 30-day money-back guarantee, and speed. What more could you want? Well, there is more, namely a great deal, for our space-time listeners. If you go to our special URL, nordvpn.com slash Stuart Gary, we'll give you an incredible four months free with all plans and up to a 69% discount on any two-year plan. 
Now, there are multiple plans available, one to suit every budget, but I can assure you the complete security package will see all your needs covered in the one plan. Here's what the package includes. There's malware protection. There's a great secure high-speed VPN service, a password manager, a terabyte of secure online storage, a tracker and ad blocker, a data breach scanner. And of course, it all comes with that 30-day money-back guarantee. So you've really got nothing to lose. Why not give it a try? When it comes to online security, you really do need to take the threat seriously. So head over now to nordvpn.com slash stuartgarry and grab one of our great deals. And of course, you can also use the coupon code stuartgarry when signing up to get the deal. And of course, the URL details will be in the show notes and on our website. And now, it's back to our show. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. This year marks the 200th anniversary of Australia's first major astronomical observatory, which was built in what is now Parramatta Park in Sydney's western suburbs. It was constructed, just 34 years after the establishment of the colony, in the gardens of Old Government House by the Governor of the British Imperial Colony of New South Wales, Lieutenant General Sir Thomas Brisbane, and operated by astronomers Carl Rumke and James Dunlop. The twin gnome structure was built out of wood and canvas. Today, only the transit piers and a solitary marble obelisk remain. But during its heyday, Parramatta Observatory produced many important discoveries and observations of the then poorly explored southern skies. Its primary mission was to produce a usable catalogue of star positions in the southern skies, eventually mapping some 7,385 stars, a substantial achievement which supplemented the South African catalogue of 1752-53. to its telescopes also observed at least two comets, numerous transits and multiple binary star systems. However, the location of the observatory proved to be a poor choice, with local populations growing quickly and smoke from home fires at night making observing less than ideal. Over time, the building lacked the maintenance needed to remain operational and in 1847 it was dismantled with its instruments and documentation reused for the Sydney Observatory, which was opened in 1858. Nick Lom, consultant curator of astronomy with the Powerhouse Museum Sydney Observatory, says the Parramatta Observatory's bicentennial is one of two major Australian astronomical anniversaries this year, the other involving no less a figure than Albert Einstein. We've got two major anniversaries this year. Uh, one relates to the Parramatta Observatory. This was the first major observatory set up in Australia. There was one a very small one set up by William Dawes, Lieutenant William Dawes, who came out for the first leap. But the Parramatta Observatory was the first the major monument observatory. This was set up by Sir Thomas Brisbane, who arrived in November 1821. Then he built an observatory at a government house in North Parramatta, and that was the timber observatory the two times, and that was completed on the 2nd of May in 1822. So it's the bicentenary of that observatory. So that's quite a major event. And just a month later, they made a major discovery. The two astronomers, Huffy Brisbane, James Dunlop and, and Carl Rumko, German astronomer, rediscovered Enki's Comet. So this was the second comet which returned to be predicted was actually seen. And it was not seen in Europe in 1922, it's not just been in South Africa, but down north in Bronca managed to see it in June 1822. And that really created lots of excitement among European astronomers and really put Australian astronomy and parameter observatory onto an international map. So that was one anniversary for a centenary. There's also a centenary of an eclipse, the Einstein eclipse, 21st of September 1922. Albert Einstein published his general theory of relativity in 1916, and one of its main predictions was that passing starlight passing near the sun would be bent for a uh, tiny amount, one and three quarters seconds apart. A very tiny amount. The only obvious way of measuring it is during the total eclipse of the sun, because at the time the sun is too bright to look at and too bright to look at stars right next to it. But it came out in 1916. Three years later, there was an eclipse in 1919, and the British government uh, or British uh, astronomers put a lot of effort into observing it. And the expedition to Brazil to an island off the coast of West Africa 
when they try to measure the deviation, there's bending of starlight, the degrade indication that it is true, but their uh, results were inconclusive. But if it's left to the 1922 clip in Australia, visible from Australia, to make a definite assessment where this deviation does happen, then there were lots of expeditions in Australia to try and observe the eclipse. There was the Nebdurch expedition to Kundavindi, but the successful one was from uh, Nick Observatory. They went to a place called Balal in uh, Western Australia near Broome, and they made observations which finally made a very definite proof that the bending did happen, and it was the first real proof the general theory of relativity. I mean, the people have been testing ever since for the last hundred years, and, and so far it has passed every single test that has been last thrown at it. That's Dr Nick Lom, consultant and curator of astronomy at the Powerhouse Museum Sydney Observatory. A Russian capsule carrying two Russian cosmonauts and an American astronaut has successfully docked to the International Space Station three and a half hours after launching aboard a Soyuz 2-1A rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan. And we are now uh, back live. Soyuz MS-22 rocket on the launch pad at Site-31 at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Atop the uh, 2.1A booster strapped into their seats in the uh, descent module of the Soyuz, NASA's Frank Rubio, along with Sergei Prokopiev and Dmitry Patelin of Roscosmos. At the time of launch, the International Space Station will be flying over northwest Uzbekistan. The station and the Expedition 67 crew will pass directly over the Baikonur Cosmodrome one minute, 58 seconds after launch, and will leapfrog past the ascending Soyuz vehicle as it heads to orbit. Eight minutes and 45 seconds after launch, the third stage engine of the Soyuz booster will shut down, and the Soyuz will separate from its launch vehicle in a preliminary orbit, deploying its solar arrays and its navigational antennas. At that point, the three crew members will be trailing the space station by about a thousand miles. The chase will begin, resulting in a docking to the Rosviet module of the International Space Station at 12.11 p.m. Central Time. All of the uh, launch preparations have gone off uh, without a hitch. Everything is in readiness. Fifteen, three, this is Altai, one, visors are closed, rescue aids are ready. Okay. At this point in the countdown, the Soyuz's first and second stage engines are ready for launch, telemetry having been received from the rocket, indicating that all primary and backup systems are set to support liftoff. Once again, uh, at the time of launch, the International Space Station will be flying 259 miles over northern Uzbekistan, some 335 statute miles behind the Soyuz as it leaves the launch pad, a very narrow uh, phase angle for launch for orbital insertion that will ensure the beginning of a two-orbit, three-plus-hour rendezvous to reach the International Space Station. And uh, during the uh, Soyuz climb to orbit, the ISS will leapfrog ahead of Soyuz, and Soyuz will then uh, be catching up to the um, International Space Station uh, through a series of pre-programmed rendezvous burns. Everything is nominal on board. We are ready for launch. Sergei Prokopiev, the uh, Soyuz commander, reporting back uh, to uh, launch launch controllers in Baikonur that everything is in readiness aboard the uh, Soyuz MS-22 spacecraft. The two umbilical towers that are buttressed up against the Soyuz, the first will retract at about the T-minus 30 or 35 second mark. The second of those two umbilicals will retract at about the 12 second mark before launch, initiating the auto sequence start for engine ignition and ultimately for liftoff. Uh, a launch key has been inserted in the launch bunker. This is a real key that trans transitions the launch sequence into automatic mode, and uh, launch controllers down at Baikonur reporting that the range is clear, the Soyuz rocket ready to begin its journey. Launch key inserted. The uh, three crew members uh, strapped into their seats in the center section of the descent module have closed their visors for launch. Sergei Prokopiev reporting that everything is in readiness on board uh, the Soyuz. Onboard systems will be switching to onboard control. The commander's cockpit displays now activated. Strip chart recorders in the Launch Control Center now activated. They will be uh, recording telemetry from the launch vehicle. 
during liftoff and its climb to orbit. The sun setting on the Central Asian desert, everything in readiness for launch at 8.54 and 49 seconds a.m. Central Time, 6.54 and 49 seconds p.m. Baikonur Time. The uh, Soyuz 2.1A booster fuel lines and other elements of the rocket engines now being purged with nitrogen to fireproof them to remove vapors of fuel and oxidizer for the final minutes of the countdown. Moments from now, a, a key uh, will be placed in the drainage position. The valves through which evaporated or gaseous oxygen escapes from the fuel tanks into the atmosphere are closed as uh, the fuel begins to drain back into the tanks. At the same time, the valves providing liquid oxygen to replenish those tanks will be lost uh, by uh, the natural boil-off or evaporation. The fuel and oxidizer tanks now being pressurized to optimize fuel flow to provide additional structural rigidity to the launch vehicle on the pad. Booster propellant tank pressurization initiated. Tank pressurization uh, underway. Everything in good shape. The vehicle is nominal. Copy. Coming up on the termination of the ground propellant feed to the Soyuz booster. The Soyuz about to go on internal power. Vehicle switch to internal power. First umbilical tower separation. First umbilical should be retracting and there it goes. The second umbilical will retract at about the T-minus 15 second mark. The uh, second umbilical has retracted. This will initiate the auto sequence start. T-minus 10 seconds and counting. We have engine start. Second umbilical tower separation. Turbo pumps coming up to flight speed. Turbo pumps, flight speed. And, and liftoff. A sunset start to the mission of Rubio, Prokopiev, and Patelin to the International Space Station. 10 seconds. Flight is nominal. Good first stage performance reported from the blockhouse at Baikonur. The Soyuz delivering 930,000 pounds of thrust from its four boosters and single engine. L plus 20, L plus 20. Arcing out to the northeast from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Nominally. Everything looking good so far. Good roll, pitch, and yaw program. The vehicle reported structural stability is good. It's feeling well. The vehicle is nominal. Velocity now about 1,100 miles per hour. The yeah, pitch and roll program all reported to be nominal from the blockhouse at Baikonur. Nominal. The vehicle is nominal. Crew is feeling well. Kopiev reporting the crew is feeling well. Now passing through the area of maximum dynamic pressure. L plus 80 parameters are nominal. Pressure in Kepirom parameter is above nominal. Copy KZO parameter of nominal, correct? Affirmative. Yes, bro, the USAT. The confirmed. And we've had uh, first stage separation. Nominal, crew is feeling well. KZO pressure parameter is nominal. Copy. KZO is nominal. Please report pressure. 8354. Eight, Second stage engine operating nominally. Launch shroud now has been jettisoned. Vehicle is nominal. The uh, Soyuz booster about 48 miles in altitude, traveling about uh, 5,200 miles an hour, some 72 miles downrange. L plus 190. Three minutes, 20 seconds into the flight. C uh, indication control descent available. Vehicle is nominal. Copy indication is on. All good reports uh, so far. The flight reported as nominal as we approach the four minute mark into the flight. Pressure reached 105.1500 for a moment. Copy. Second stage uh, engine continues uh, to burn as planned as we approach the four minute 15 second mark into the flight, about halfway through powered flight now, about 15 seconds away from second stage shutdown and the ignition of the third stage. L plus 270 parameters are nominal. Second stage separation confirmed. Second stage shutdown and separation is confirmed. The Soyuz now uh, climbing to orbit on the singular power of its third stage engine. Five minutes, 12 seconds into the flight, about three and a half minutes of powered flight remaining. L plus 310, launch vehicle is stable. Vehicle is nominal, crew 
is feeling well. Procopia reports uh, that the crew is doing well. This uh, third stage engine providing 67,000 pounds of thrust for the uh, remaining three minutes of powered flight. 350. A true trajectory so far for the Soyuz booster, now flying on the uh, third stage propulsion of its singular engine. Good roll pitch and yaw reported, good structural stability reported. 380 seconds, the engine of the third phase is working nominally. 400 seconds, uh, the uh, stabilization of the article is in place. It is stable. Altai. Good uh, structural stability of the uh, Soyuz vehicle at the seven-minute mark into the flight, about one minute, 45 seconds of powered flight remaining. Yaw, pitch, and roll all reported to be nominal. At the time of uh, third-stage shutdown and spacecraft separation, control of the Soyuz vehicle through docking will uh, transition to the uh, flight control team at the Russian Mission Control Center outside of Moscow. Nominal crew is feeling great. We have now uh, reached the eight-minute mark into the flight, 45 seconds away from third stage shutdown and spacecraft separation. 480, uh, the parameters uh, of the launcher is nominal and uh, everything is nominal on orbit and the crew is feeling great. We're waiting for the separation. 520. And we have third stage shutdown and spacecraft separation, the third stage dropping away. Time tag commands now uh, will deploy the solar arrays and the navigational antennas. Altai, Super Moscow. Altai, Moscow. Altai, Super Moscow. Altai, Moscow. And we now have confirmation of a uh, perfect solar array and navigational antenna deploy. The Soyuz MS-22 now in its preliminary orbit, and the chase has begun to catch up to the International Space Station with docking planned just three hours from now after a two-orbit a journey docking scheduled at 12:11 p.m. central time the flight came as russian president vladimir putin threatened the world with nuclear war if nato interferes with russia's bloody invasion of ukraine the soyuz ms22 docked with the space station's russian razvet research module after just two orbits of the planet the crew will spend 188 days in orbit before returning to earth next march it's one of the few examples left of Western cooperation with Moscow and demonstrates the need for continued cooperation between the Russian Federal Space Agency at Roscosmos and NASA involving the jointly run space station, despite unprecedented sanctions against Russia and more evidence of war crimes being committed against Ukraine's civilian population. And this rare example of cooperation will continue next month when a Russian cosmonaut will fly up to the space station with a NASA crew aboard a SpaceX Dragon capsule. The Russian cosmonauts and Western astronauts working together in orbit have tried to steer clear of the conflict raging down on the Earth below. The International Space Station is divided into separate U.S. and Russian orbital segments, with the Russians providing propulsion and the Americans providing auxiliary power and life support. This division of resources forces both sides to work together. The other partners in the space station are Canada, Japan and the European Space Agency, and they all share the American segment. Moscow says it plans to leave the space station sometime after 2024, when the first module of its new Russian space station enters orbit. It's not known how much, if any, of the Russian segment of the space station they'll take with them when they go. But we'll keep you informed. This is Space Time. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. 
or by becoming a space-time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial-free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group, and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Space Time YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 